Welcome in, everybody, to another edition of GC Live Talking Tuesday Nights. The regular season for the Gamecocks, of course, came to an end a week ago. But there's still a lot to get to. That is why we're continuing to do these shows, and we're going to continue to do it leading up to the bowl game. And, Joe, look, there's a lot to get to, and I want to be able to get you right on um, into the program early on because, look, <clears throat> we said this last week, because of the timeline with the transfer portal opening up on Monday, December 5th, which, of course, was yesterday, the fact that you also had the bowl announcement for the game Cox, which was announced on Sunday, there's a lot that's transpired since last Tuesday. In addition to that, in addition to that, and we already knew this, with Marcus Satterfield leaving, what that means now for South Carolina's future as they continue to figure out who that next OC is going to be, as well as who's going to be the OC for the bowl game. So there's a lot to get to tonight. I feel like we have to start with the transfer portal because it is the freshest news yep. What's going on right now in college football? Of course, the news that took place with Jaheim Bell last night. Uh, that is fresh on the mind of many Gamecock fans. And we'll have your thoughts as well as Joe's thoughts. I'll share my thoughts as well on it. Um, <clears throat> because I think it's one of those things where it's like, look, I was going to come on, on here regardless and be able to you know, share my thoughts on the transfer portal, where we're at right now, where that number is currently at. And you can track that on on three. But I don't think it changes regardless if Jaheim Bell goes into the portal or if it was another Gamecock or if they hadn't, hadn't gone into the portal at all. I would have said the same exact thing. So I just want to get that out there uh, before we begin things. So, Joe, with that being said, the news last night, of course, Jaheim Bell entering the transfer portal. I can't say I'm surprised. Can't say I'm surprised because, um, look, Going back to the season, we knew that there was frustration with Bell to the point where his family members, family members, were taking to social media, okay? Yeah. I try not to bring family in at all when we talk about these student athletes. However, however, when you go public with certain things, it's fair game. Not fair game to go after them. You know, fans want to do that. That's fine. In terms of what my responsibility is, what my job is, that's what I do. Okay, yeah. We talk about these things. So that is why I'm bringing that up. Before we even take another step forward, though, Joe, let me say this again, whether it be Jaheim Bell or anybody. Even before NIL was in the mix, even before the transfer portal was really a thing, even though you could transfer before, Players, families, they all are going to do what's best for them, okay? There's going to be different situations, whether it be situations both on and off the field, all right? That hasn't changed. What has changed, of course, is the added layer of NIL and the opportunities that some student athletes are going to want to look at. Obviously, playing time is there too, right? But NIL just makes it a little bit more interesting. Again, not saying this specifically about Jaheim. I'm talking about just in general. That is the new era of college football that we are living in. So to see that news last night, Joe, I say all these things. I want to know what you thought as soon as you saw the Jaheim Bell news. I mean, personally, I, I, I kind of saw it coming. Um, I did see some tweets from his family members, um, one, one of which his uncle tweeting, at Coach Prime in Colorado, but the Colorado Buffaloes asking who to get in touch with for recruiting. I noticed that that was, I believe, Saturday, possibly Sunday. Sunday um, night. That was a big thing. Yeah, Sunday night. So I saw that tweet, and I, I, I mean, I kind of knew, and also kind of throughout the year, Mike talking about the family situation. I know, um, you know, his family is super involved in as with any college athletes. You want to keep your family around you, and you want to, you know, have a super good support network. But um, I wasn't necessarily surprised. The, the news that did surprise me was Austin Stogner yesterday. Um, I, I didn't necessarily hear any rumblings um, from internally or like externally about him leaving. Um, I, 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 from the people that I talked to, um, it, it was not really a, a, a pointed at thing that he was going to leave um, and, and sources were, hadn't said anything whether he was going to leave or not. Um, so that was a bigger surprise to me than Jaheim Bell. 
Um, you kind of sense that Jaheim wasn't really um, in it as much. And, you know, he wasn't getting the touches that he wanted on the offense. He wasn't as involved. And, I mean, I think he was pretty involved in the offense. And as a tight end, for a guy that wants to be a superstar tight end, yeah, those aren't necessarily the touches that you're getting, Mike, or the mm-hmm. touches that you want to get. But um, I think he was plenty involved in the offense in, in my terms, but I'm not Jaheim Bell. So, I, I, I mean, I really don't know what's going through his head. But quite frankly, it didn't really shock me. Um, I'd had a pre-write written, I think, since last week. I mean, and that's those pre-writes are written up just in case. But, um, you know, Gene mm-hmm. Bell was not really a guy that kind of shocked me whether or not he was going to go to the next level or transfer out. Um, I wasn't exactly sure which. But, um, yeah, Jaheim Bell, not really surprising. Stogner, on the other hand, definitely surprising. And we're going to get into Stogner, too. I don't want people to think that this is just going to be the Jaheim Bell show because at the end of the day, um, you know, it's – Obviously, obviously, the news about Bell is going to grab people's attention probably a little bit more than Stogner, and that's not like you know a slight against the kid. It's just going to grab people's attention more. Why? Because well, Bell started, you know, he, he got things going. He got things going here at South Carolina. Then of course he leaves. What is interesting, Joe, and I don't know if you had the opportunity to see it yet. Um, I will just say this. There was a Garnet Trust interview with Jaheim Bell over the weekend. Okay. There was a Garnet Trust interview that has not been uploaded. I don't know if it will be uploaded now. Um, I wonder if I'm going to get a text from <clears throat> someone at GC upset that I'm saying all this. I probably shouldn't. I mean, I mean, I shouldn't get, no one should be upset. I mean, interviewed. It was a big freaking party. People saw that Colin was doing the interview. Um, and Colin asked Jaheim, this is something that hasn't been talked about because why would anyone know this? Colin asked Jaheim about his future. And I'm paraphrasing right now after watching that interview. But this was on Saturday night. And Jaheim said about his future, you know, that he hasn't really thought about it much, but he's thought about it. But he hasn't thought about it. So I say all that because the timeline, as I think for a lot of fans, I think that's what's upsetting people, right? You see the T-shirt deal, the T-shirt tweet in the morning, and then 11 hours later, that's when the news comes out. Again, families, players, right? There's multiple layers that go into why a player enters the transfer portal. I'm never going to sit here and say that a player shouldn't take advantage of that. I know fans are going to get upset at sometimes about that. I understand that. I understand. That's why you're a fan. Okay. I understand that. But when I hear this though, when I hear the, I'm thinking about, but I'm not. And then you see the shirt get uploaded on Monday morning. And then the announcement Monday evening, what changed? What changed? And that's a fair question. That's a fair question. I don't know if we're going to get that answer. I don't know if we're going to get that answer anytime soon. That's the frustrating part, I feel like, from the fan base. Or at least that's what I'm sensing. That's why the fan base is upset. And I added that caveat about the Garnet Trust interview that took place on Saturday with Colin Taylor because that's something that fans didn't even know about. Didn't even know about. And I'm bringing it up. Because I feel like it is my responsibility to share with you as much as I can to be as transparent with you. That's what we try to do at Gamecock Central. So to see that interview, and again, it's nothing like earth shadowing, like, you know, Bell was like, yeah, I'm coming back or this or that, you know, but it's just the fact of, yeah, I really haven't thought too much about it. Well, what the hell changed over two days? That's how, that, that's, that's, that's what, that's what I want to know. That's what I want to know. What changed? Um, does he owe anyone a resp- uh, an answer to that? No. But, again, this is what we do. We talk about sports, okay? You know, this is what we yeah. do. We talk about it. You're playing at the SEC level. You're not playing at Division II Assumption. You're not playing at a small little Division Three school. You're not playing at an NAIA. You're playing in the SEC. You're playing in a conference that generates not millions, but billions of dollars. When you sign up to play football in the SEC, when you sign up to play in a state like South Carolina that doesn't have any professional sports teams in it, 
No disrespect to the Columbia Fireflies. You know what I'm talking about. When you don't have pro teams in a state, it's going to get magnified even more. So listening and reading the responses from fans over the last, I could say, 24 hours now about, I think it's fair. I think their, their, their questions are fair. And we mentioned the tweets before. You mentioned the tweet from the uncle. Dolores, who I have nothing but respect for. Okay? Again, the only reason we're bringing up parents' names here or family members' names is because when you enter social media and you voice your opinions and they get to a level where I'm having former players text me today and saying, you know, I this is something, that, again, not directed at Bell, this is something that future players need to tell their family members, hey, look, when you do that, you're putting everything out there and then it becomes a story. Because there's going to be people saying, you know, why are the? It becomes a story. It becomes a story. Whether you agree with it or not, it becomes a story. It's part of the narrative. And I wanted to correct you on Joe with what Dolores said, because she responded back to a tweet of mine. And she said that he is a recruiting director and a high school coach. He's a JV coach. I don't, I don't want to sit here and, you know, we can, we can, you know, keep moving the goalposts talking about this and that. Take that for what it's worth. Yeah. Take that for what it's worth. Because we saw a couple months ago, I think it was the end of October, end of October, when Bell was not getting targeted, that's when that first tweet came out from the uncle. You know, it's time to move on. It's time to move on. So I can understand the frustration from the fan base. I can understand the frustration when you're talking about NIL too. There's people that invest a lot of money now into the program. Not just, I mean, you know, obviously not just Gamecock football, but other athletic programs. But we, we'd be lying here to ourselves if we said, okay, it's not – okay, Gamecock football is the one that's – you know, we know women's basketball, but people are spending a lot of money on it for football, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be failings that are going to be upset about this. And I don't blame the fan base. I don't blame the fan base, but at the same time, too, it's part of it. It's this new era. Whether Bell, whether Austin Stogner, whoever it is, they have that right now. You don't have to agree with it. They're doing, again, like with what I said at the beginning, they're going to do what is in their best interest, what, what they believe is in their best interest. Sometimes that will be the case, and it will work. Sometimes it might not. But if Bell feels like he's going to help himself both on and off the field, or it could be just strictly an on-field business decision, then he's going to do that. Just like player X, Y, Z, it doesn't matter. We're talking here about Bell because, of course, this just happened last night. But this could be anybody. Anybody, Joe. Yeah, Mike, absolutely. And, I mean, I think Jaheim Bell is – I mean, we're picking on him because he and his family have been Intern the most Joe vocal. That. I'm getting right? corrected. Intern Joe. You haven't graduated yet. Intern Joe, continue. Yeah, intern. I, I saw the comment. Yeah, the comment. Uh, but yeah, no, so I, I mean, I agree. I think we're picking on Bell because like he, his family has been the most vocal, right? But at the end of the day, guys are going to do what they think is best and you can't really stop them, right? That's that's the nature of the transfer portal nowadays too. Um, I mean, we talked about Coach Prime a little bit. You've, I, I don't know if anyone's seen the clip of him going in the locker room and saying, hey, the transfer portal is what it is now. So we're going to yep. bring guys in. We were bringing guys in, and I think that was more of to motivate the guys in the room in Colorado. But, I mean, he's not kidding either. He's going to go after the transfer portal, and we saw Shane do it a little bit with Spencer, uh, you know, bringing guys in. Juice Wells is a transfer. We saw how much South Carolina attacked the transfer portal. So it's the reality of college football that guys are going to come and go. It's a free agency-like market almost nowadays, and guys are going to do what's best for them. And so, I mean, I, I really don't blame – obviously, you don't blame Jaheim because he's doing what is best for him. And if we were in the same situation and felt like we could go get a better situation – or better better scenario, better like, like NIL stuff, better – everything really touches offense, you would definitely go after it, right? But, I mean, on, on the topic of NIL, I saw a, a national reporter um, with, with another company say that insiders had said Jaheim was upset with the NIL situation. And granted, I don't necessarily see that, Mike. Um, I think South Carolina is set up um, as one of the best NIL schools 
in the country. Um, just recently with the, with the NIL firm that they hired and God bless Garnet trust. Like I know Garnet trust does plenty for these athletes. Um, so I know South Carolina is set up just as good as anybody um, in my eyes. And so I don't necessarily understand that aspect of it. And I mean, we saw the t-shirts. I know the fan base is really, really upset about, you know, him not really, you know, him playing the brand and playing the role of Jaheim Bell, you know, tight end at South Carolina right up until Monday, you know, trying to sell his shirts, tweeting yep. South Carolina things um, going up until, you know, just recently on Monday. And I understand how, how that feels, you know, you feel duped almost. And, you know, I, I, I understand the frustration with that. And that's just, I mean, I guess that's the reality on how some guys are going to be like that. And I mean, we've seen it with coaches too in the past. Um, when Brian Kelly left Cincinnati to go to Notre Dame and Notre Dame to LSU, right up until the day he took the job, everyone thought he was going to be the head coach the next year. So I think that's just the nature of this and how, you know, the transfer portal has evolved. I, I, there's over a thousand players in the transfer portal already. And that was on Monday. So I'm sure there's way more in there today. And I, I, I think that's just the nature of it. It's, it's almost like yep. a free agency thing now with NIL coming into play and guys are going to do that, right? Cause they don't want to have to face the criticism necessarily before they do it and sometimes guys flip their mind just like that sometimes that happens within 24 hours they get they talk to coaches and they talk to other situations and they they hear that kind of timing so i I think it's a little bit it's the timing and you're seeing joey here and i know other people have said it it's the timing i think that's upsetting people right if if i i I mean look if jaheem bell had just left uh and we got to remind people okay we got to remind people the NCAA this past summer, they, they passed a, a new rule where you have two windows, two windows for players to be able to enter the transfer portal. OK, that first cycle is, I believe, December 5th to January 18th. It's a 45 day window. I could be a day or two off, but, you know, you get the picture. I'll uh, I'll try to get those exact dates up here, but you have those days. So that's why day one of the transfer portal officially opened yesterday whether or not bell whether or not stock whether or not these certain players were waiting for that to happen okay that it's it's open now and it is okay the winter window as it's labeled december 5th to january 18th the second window is referred to as the spring window okay that's gonna run for this academic year may 1st to may 15th i like the idea of that one because i'm gonna i'm sure there's gonna be some people saying okay why why are they doing a second one well the good thing about that one is because at that point, spring football's done. So it's going to allow players to enter the transfer portal if they go out there and they realize, okay, you know what? Maybe there's a position that I thought I was going to be able to win out. I don't like my, you know, I don't like my odds or whatever, and I want to transfer. Okay. Okay. Um, again, the timing between some of the tweets that we saw from Jaheim over the last couple of days, I think it was just two or three days ago. Some of the things for, uh, you know, about Beamer in, in terms of positives, right? Um, and this doesn't mean his, his uh, love for South Carolina has changed. I'm sure there's a lot of fans that will disagree with me about that. And I understand. I'm not telling you how to feel about that. I'm just trying to more so kind of be thinking in the middle of this all, right? You got the fans over here trying to get it to fit. You got the fans over here. Then you got Bell um, on the other side of it all. I think, um, I think just, I don't know, you know, again, I've had, I've had national reporters reached out to me about this. I've had some players, uh, reach out to me about this, whether it be on South Carolina, whether it be former players. And the notion is some, the timing just seems odd. That's all it is. That's all it is. And I don't, I think that's a fair statement to say fair statement. And again, we can sit here and people can want to move the goalpost. That's fine. Move it. It's what happens when you throw out different layers like I am at you. The bottom line is, yes, portal opened up on the 5th. But go back and look at some of those tweets. Not just from Jaheim, the family. Go back and look at the fact that there was a tweet in the morning of, the morning of the day that Bell announced that he was going to enter the portal. That's where I think people are upset at. Something just seems off there. In regards to whatever he does, you know, goes wherever he decides to go, okay? Personally, I mean, I never had any issues with Jaheim or his family. I wish him nothing but the best, you know? 
Um, this is just our job to talk about it. But again, um, I think everyone has a right to be upset from a fan standpoint. Um, but I also think, you know, it's, it's part of this new era, right? It's part of this new era. And the timing on this one might have upset people more than anything. Um, but I'm not surprised to see, right, putting that stuff to the side, just using it, the example of Bell. I'm not surprised to see players enter the portal that have a lot of talent, and it may come as a surprise. And the reason I say that, Joe, is, and I'm not saying this is the case with Bell, I've said this before, we're beginning to get to a point now with the portal and NIL where it's like, okay, we talk about how it's become the new norm. We have a better understanding of it. And when you have a better understanding of things, and especially when there's a lot of gray area, which of course there is plenty of it with both these things, there's going to be times where you're going to feel good about what's going on. And you're going to want to try something. And I feel like some of these players, again, not saying specifically bell, I'm talking in general. Some players are going to want to test the waters of the portal, kind of like free agency. Who's going to come after me, if anyone does? And will there be NIL opportunities that will present themselves? Looks like intern Joe froze. So I'll get intern Joe to, to get ready, and then uh, we'll go back to intern Joe in a second. But those are the things that I feel like are going to continue to happen. Um, I, I saw some questions asked about – bell and possibly returning uh, tilton says do you think he you know he got a chance to come back meaning bell do you think he has a chance to come back if they announce the oc or um you think bell's gone look i think what's going to happen ultimately is that bell's not going to come back now i could be wrong could be wrong but if you're asking my opinion based on that i don't think that's going to happen i don't know beamer's policy on it when it comes to players entering the portal and i say policy because I've had conversations with numerous coaches at plenty of different schools. Okay. I've talked to USC coaches, both, you know, currently on staff, former, co and the consensus has been, if you enter the portal, don't expect your spot to be here. If you want to come back personally, that's how I would go about things. That's how I'd go about things because when you get into a position where it's like that kid is going to test the waters. Well, number one, he's clearly telling you that he's not a hundred percent committed to the program for whatever reasons, whether it be playing time, whether it be um, NIL opportunities, whether it be as Austin Stogner said today, you know, maybe your player wants to be closer to home. That's okay. That's okay. But maybe they just truly don't want to be as, you know, a hundred percent committed to South Carolina. Right. So I bring those things up because I'm sure you're going to see players in the future who are really, really, really good players. Could even be some high five stars. Could be a guy that becomes a freaking All-American and he dips his toes in the transfer portal waters because he's looking to see what can happen. What can happen in the NIL space? Will a school come after me and will there be an opportunity for there to be a large amount of NIL profit out there. I think as we're learning here with NIL, NIL is not a bad thing, but I don't think some of these players truly understand what's going to happen with some of this, right? In terms of the, 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 the crazy amounts of money, that, that, there's only going to be a small percent of student athletes that are going to fall into that category where they're going to be able as intern Joe's back with us. They're going to be the ones that get paid a lot of money, a lot of money. I know this for a fact that Jaheim Bell had multiple NIL opportunities while he was in South Carolina. So I bring that up because for people, and again, I don't know the kid's bank account or anything like that, but he had NIL, NIL opportunities. I've seen people on Twitter getting upset with the university. I've seen people getting upset with one another about NIL. I'm not saying that, okay, don't worry about spending more money. You want to do that, it's your prerogative, okay? But 
I think with NIL, though, Joe, what we're noticing is there's going to be some that want more. That's just life, right? They want more. Um, so, you know, look, if Bell feels like, just like a free agent, right? If he feels like that is something that he wants to chase, and it's for NIL reasons, again, we're just making assumptions here. Yeah. Um, Brad Crawford, who works at 24-7, I know he reported yesterday that two of the reasons why Bell was leaving is, you know, he wants to be in a, uh, a system that uses him better, and he wants to be able to have more opportunities in the NIL space. That is why I'm bringing that up, okay? That is based on that report. I know we're at on three, but I'll always give credit. You break something, you report on something, I will always give you credit. So Brad Carford said that over at 24-7. And the, the NIL opportunity, it's just he had he had multiple opportunities. We did stuff with him at Garnet Trust. He just did a Garnet Trust interview the other day. So the NIL opportunities here at South Carolina, don't get things twisted when you hear that out there right brad crawford reporting that and if that is the case there are plenty of nil opportunities in columbia south carolina i'm back up here in boston okay the nil opportunities that exist up here they don't they don't if they are they're very very few okay very very few if you told me a player was leaving boston college to go down to a different school whatever because of NIL opportunities up here, I'd be like, okay, yeah, I can see that. There's plenty of NIL opportunities in South Carolina. There are plenty of them. So I just, that was something that stood out to me, though, Joe. Yeah. Like, absolutely. I agree. And I mean, I think this market, we talked about it a little bit earlier. There's no pro teams in this market. And SEC football is so much bigger. SEC football is its own brand, it's its own way of life. So I think it's huge. And I mean, I, I hate to bring up Notre Dame and coming from South Bend this week, but, uh, you know, up even in South Bend, the NIL opportunities are limited. You know, I, I, I can see guys that are, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say struggling because there are opportunities, but there aren't nearly as many out here. Not as many people. I mean, Notre Dame football is a big brand, but even up there in South Bend, um, you know, not as many people care about Notre Dame football as people do South Carolina football. I, I, I think from a support standpoint, right. I mean, I think there's a lot of alumnus in the Notre Dame network who, who support and whatnot, and that's that's all fine and dandy. But, I mean, I from from my perspective, when I got down here, there are so many more people and there's so much more buy-in um, in terms of, like, a local standpoint that you can get from NIL, at least here, um, compared to up there. And I think you're hitting the nail on the head. Northern, you know, teams and colleges are competing with not only pro teams, but, you know, other sports, like other markets. Like, it is – pro teams are just bigger up north. And down south, college sports rules. And so I think that's one thing where, you know, not only the SEC, but South Carolina is set up for success is because people don't give, don't care as much about pro teams down here. It's not the way of life versus even up, up north in South Bend. Everyone is like all, all my friends were, you know, more concerned or, or they care just as much about the Bears as they did with, with Notre Dame football. So I, I think it's different down here. It really is. There's something about SEC football and SEC you know, culture in the South. And it's just based around colleges where I think, you know, NIL wise are just set up better. Um, and I don't necessarily know, like if we can, we'll speculate again with NIL uh, or with Jaheim going to Colorado. Like, I don't, I mean, maybe it's a coach prime effect that he's looking for or something. I don't know. But um, I, I, I just think that, you know, I don't really understand the the whole missing out on the NIL logic because not only Garnet trust, but there, there's, there's other opportunities that I've seen, not only J or like Jaheim take, um, but but other players on this team that aren't necessarily. It's not like Garnet Trust is the only thing that exists, um, and so I I don't necessarily Garnet, right, rise or whatever the heck it's called Carolina Rise. Yeah, um, I know there's the Big Spur does that. Um, I, I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah. Um, but I I bring that up because yeah, there's opportunities, yeah, and absolutely. I I bring that I bring that comparison up. The receiver for Boston College who yeah i mean and i always like there's there's plenty plenty of opportunities and i mean okay also too if we're going to talk more about jaheem bell um and coach prime um we uh we got to talk about you know just the general nature of the portal you good mike yeah sorry about that a little uh technical glitch here um uh, but i think look 
again, again, with the transfer portal and everything else going on, I understand that. And I know we've spent a lot of time on this, but I think it's just so fresh. It's hard not to talk about. Um, I do want to hit on some of these things that people have brought up and we'll, we'll try to do them quickly so we can continue to move along the show. Um, Josh brings this up. You know, I heard uh, Stogner is leaving because South Carolina does have an offer grad program and he wanted to be closer to home. I don't know that about the grad program, Joe, you might, uh, but I do know that being home was certainly a big, big, big uh, part of his decision. Yeah. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, what grad program he's involved in, but that um, I know South Carolina offers plenty of them. Um, the closer to home argument makes sense too, because he is pretty far away from home and whatnot, but um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, what major he's in, but um, you know, yep. I, I mean, it would make sense from a football standpoint. It's a, it's a little bit more reasonable to, to, you know, I guess get with that versus Jaheim's standpoint where it's, you know, offensive and like playing time and NIL things, it's a little bit harder to understand at least because we've been talking about the whole NIL thing for about 20, 30 minutes here, Mike. It's, it's definitely a thing where like we're, we're, we're kind of like in shock and it's definitely a real thing to talk about versus Stogner. And in, in, in terms of that, like it's, it's reasonable, you can see it and you hope the best for the guy in that standpoint. And you can understand with it, resonate with it versus the NIL and the playing time and role in the offense. That's something it's like, you, you can bring a question to it for sure. And something about Stogner, too, is he graduated from Oklahoma before he arrived here. So I want to throw that out there. He was a little bit ahead um, in the classroom. you know. So I just want to mention that. J-Dub says, are we going to clean house on offense? I like Step, but maybe there is a better or uh, – I think he meant to say better receiver coach – or the OC wants to bring his own guys in. Um, I think Justin Step needs to stay, um, and I think you should make sure he stays. He's done a tremendous job. We saw that with the – growth with certain receivers um i think he i thought he did a tremendous job i know some people would have liked to see the carry on joiner used a little bit more um but i felt like he helped his game elevate to that next level especially as a receiver um i think what he was able to do with talented guys like juice wells even Corey rucker before getting hurt i mean jalen brooks my goodness i mean he had plenty of motivation to when he got back into uh, the swing of things at South Carolina. But what I really liked about the receivers in particular, especially down the stretch, was their stock blocking. The stock blocking against Tennessee was some of the best that I've seen in a long, long time um, from South Carolina in, 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 gen in you know, general. Um, but, I mean, uh, specifically, but in general, I mean, just watching what they did against the Vols, I, I thought that was very impressive. Um, and we know Greg Atkins is on the road right now. Uh, I, I like, look, I think what it's going to come down to is you bring an OC in depending on if there's some changes on the offensive side. Right. Um, and I'm not hinting at anything. I'm just, we're having a conversation. If Montario, right. If Montario is in here next season, if Greg Atkins is in here next season for whatever reason, right. These things are possible. Maybe there's another opportunity out there. Maybe there is a position where they're able to elevate their career, right? We've seen that sometimes with NFL coaches coming down and trying to swoop in and take some college. Co there could be other opportunities out there. That happens every year. Every college has to deal with that. So I bring that up because um, that is something obviously to keep an eye on, but I think being able to keep the core of your coaching staff, the best you can, obviously people know, uh, what Pete Lembo means to this program. And I think people would give up their own freaking houses if it meant that Lembo would get more money uh, because of what he was able to do with special teams and not just special teams, but he's up North right now recruiting. Uh, I don't know if he actually head back, you know, I know they got the, uh, the private jet, they keep flying back and forth, but he might still be up here. I know that he was in Pennsylvania today. Um, I know some of the people that he's talking to. Um, I know one player in particular would be a graduate. Um, and I can tell you that he'd be a player that uh, can make an impact. I'll leave it at that um, from another school because they don't offer graduate programs and, you know, graduate players aren't able to play anyway, but I bring that up because he's up here right now. Um, but Justin Sepp, again, not just from the, the coaching side of it, recruiting his connection with the area, Especially, I mean, we hear people gripe all the time. Right now, got got to make sure again the South Carolina kids, again the South Carolina kids. He knows the area. He knows the area. Having Justin step on your staff, I think, is very, very vital. I went much longer than I wanted to on that. Um, 
keep going down the list. I'll try to be quick with some of these because there's like 17, 18 uh, additional ones that have piled up here. So we probably have about 30 comments to get to, Joe. So we'll try to go through these a little bit quicker. Uh, Josh, again, the timing sucks. Another uh, show brought up the point that if Beamer talked to him and said, yeah, that's always a possibility. Um, I don't. I don't believe they had a meeting on Monday, though. Um, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I don't think Beamer met with the players on Monday. Um, so I bring that up. I bring that up because unless something dramatically changed, plus the other part of it is, too, we don't know who the offensive coordinator is going to be. So to sit here and say, and Josh, I'm not picking on you. I'm just using your, your, your question. It's tough to say, okay, you know, he's he wouldn't factor in at this position or that position because you don't know what the offense is going to look like uh, quite yet next year. Tommy Wallace, and I'll get your thoughts on this, though, Joe. Be real quick with these. Uh, if the NCAA does not set more guidelines on the NIL soon, it will destroy the future uh, of a whole lot of uh, potentially talented student athletes. Your thoughts? I think the big thing that gets over a lot more than anything with NIL is that it it's going to have a trickle-down effect, and it's going to change the mindset, right? Where before it was – you go to college, and obviously, look, we can sit here. We, we understand the importance of getting a degree, okay? And I'm not trying to overshadow that. But you go to college, you play college football, and if you're good enough, you're going to play at the NFL level, okay? And you're going to get paid. Now it's, I want to get my money now. I mean, there's some athletes, some, okay? Because obviously this happened during a time. This happened uh, while some players were already in college. So this doesn't obviously apply for everyone, some, but – there's some players now that are going to college. They have not played one snap and yet they have NIL opportunities lined up. Okay. I know at on three, we have the NIL uh, valuation. It gives you a breakdown of how much a player is worth. I know that for my dad's team, they have a player going to Georgia and I was just looking him up on, um, on, on three and just seeing what his value was. I was just showing my dad how that works. So I bring those things up because that's a kid that literally just played in the state championship game in Massachusetts this past weekend. And he's getting, you know, evaluate. This is how much he's worth from an NIL space standpoint. And obviously that can improve based on uh, playing the, the field and uh, you know, the amount of social media followers. So I bring that up because it's just the mindset. And again, we're generalizing here. We're grouping everyone in. Um, this doesn't mean every player thinks this way. But I do feel like just that the mentality is changing, Joe, where it's, okay, what can I do to get my money instead of what can I do to get on the field? And if I do well in the field, that's going to help my draft stock. Yeah, Mike, absolutely. I think it just adds the wrinkle of – it just kind of keeps guys in college football, if you will. Um, guys were making moves based on going to the NFL versus now they're making moves on not only going to the NFL, but number two – getting their money now. Um, and I think, you know, not all players are like that. Some players want to play to win. Some players want to move up to the NFL. It's different between every guy. So I think it, it kind of just depends on how it, how it goes um, between each case and whatnot. And there are guys who know that they're not necessarily going to have an NFL career. So those guys are definitely looking for the NIL side of things. So I, I think it just adds a different wrinkle and it definitely keeps some good players in college. That's for sure. I think the, the Kroger tweet, as Joey points out, if you haven't seen it, I mean, pretty much, yeah, all we have is all we need. Um, not to be a wise ass. Certainly, South Carolina needs a little bit more if they want to get over the hump. Okay, we get that. But with that being said, I think what Kroger's trying to allude to is like, hey, look, you know, the guys that want to be here are going to be here. Okay. And you need to be able to have that bunker like mentality. So I think that's what that, that, that tweet was about. Um, do I think it was about Bell leaving? 1,000%. 1,000%. Um, and I'll kind of just leave it off at that. Uh, Richard, you know, get with it and get used to it or get left behind. Beamer knows how to use the portal. He does. Totally. And I think one thing, though, is is you have to be willing to adapt, Joe. You have to be willing to adapt with the portal. I mentioned before that there's going to be coaches out there. I know, obviously, Gamecock fans have their thoughts on Dabo. Dabo had his thoughts about the transfer portal and obviously multiple things outside of where college football was maybe six, seven, eight years ago. They're even adapting. They have to. If you don't adapt in life, you get left behind, right? Um, so I bring that up because 
What Beamer was able to accomplish in the transfer portal a year ago, phenomenal, okay? Phenomenal. And, and the results speak for itself. We saw what happened this season, eight and four. And now you have an opportunity to earn your what? I believe it would be their eighth time in program history that they've won nine games or more. I mean, they just finished the regular season with eight wins. That's only happened 13 times in program history that they've won eight games to end a regular season. So I bring those things up because, yeah, what we saw them do, obviously from a recruiting standpoint too last year, some of the young guys, Nick Eamon Worry, the impact he was able to have, my goodness, uh, named today all SEC freshmen. But I, I, I bring that up because while there was good things that happened last year, Joe, you have to continue to adapt. And there was one thing that I think needs the – needs to be uh, mentioned the number of players that are leaving there's going to be guys leaving more schools i think um in the coming years unless something changes with the rules that it's going to be the responsibility of coaches of trying to find ways to keep them happy right and trying to find ways to to make sure that that once they commit you have to find ways to keep them there but at the same time too you can't worry and, you know, put all your attention, right? If intern Joe wants to go and work at, I don't know, Speedway, I don't know, uh, get, get an oil change or whatever, he wants to go over there and wants to leave Gamecock Central, right? Brian Shoemaker might be like, all right, well, there's only so much. And if he, his heart's desired on that, you know, so be it. And it's probably not the best comparison in the world, but I think the point being is if there are players that are going to want to leave, OK, there's going to be some guys that you will bring up that will say, hey, look, we are going to do everything we can to be able to keep them here. But at the same time, too, we can't worry about if they're not happy about um, NIL opportunity. Depend, You can't waste all your resources and time on that. You have to worry about more now, I feel like, than ever before, because now you have to worry about other players who also could be entering the transfer portal. You have to deal with recruiting. In that everything's sped up now because that early signing day is really the main signing day now, especially for Power Five schools. So it's um, it's different. Yes, uh, Joe, I, may, I know you saw this about Ross entering the portal. Yeah, absolutely. I just saw it. Um, I noticed on Twitter, and then some of the comments did a good job um, bringing it up. I think Tyrese Ross, another guy. That, you know, he's one of the, the guys that's, you know, not necessarily on the roster, you know, or on the the, the two deep that's really playing a lot. Um, and he's making the decision based on playing time, get a fresh start, fresh situation. Um, I think that's all Tyrese Ross's um, deal here. It's not necessarily like Jaheim Bell or the NIL stuff. I think it's just a playing time situation, get yep. a fresh start. Um, you know, and obviously there are guys that are going to do that. And Tyrese Ross is one of them. And you wish him the best. Yeah. And look, there's going to be guys that, are going to want opportunities to play more, right? I mean, there's a former uh, Gamecock quarterback who actually just entered the portal again in Jason Brown. And I think it will be his fourth school if he if he's able to get to get actually a, a, a waiver uh, from the NCAA to grant him an extra year of eligibility because of, I think it would be his seventh year because he had COVID in there, redshirt year, uh, he had an injury in there. But I bring up Jason Brown, that'll be his fourth school in four years if he's able to land on his feet. I bring that up because he wants an opportunity to play. Um, not everyone's going to start, okay? And that's I, I bring that up about Jason Brown. That's not to say that he's not capable of starting. You know, he wants to go out there. He wants to be able to go play. More power to him. More power to him. But I think some of these players, you know, if you are a sophomore, red-shirted freshman, yeah, you have a decision to make. But I wouldn't just press the – the exit button, right? Just, or reset button, excuse me. I didn't start this year. I didn't get playing time this year. I'm gone. Again, we don't know some of these conversations that are happening at the end of the year. I can tell you what those conversations are like because I had to go through them when I was in college playing ball. You have uh, a meeting with your positional coach, kind of go over um, some of the things that you were able to accomplish that season, some of the things that you need to get better at, some of the things that they want you to be able to get better at, and you kind of set some goals in place. Then you meet with the head coach, very similar. Now, in some cases, when you're in those meetings with those head coaches or even your positional coach, 
mean, I wasn't in a situation like this, uh, thank God. But I do know that sometimes coaches, and you mentioned Coach Prime before, some coaches kind of like a scared straight, straight, uh, scared straight program, they try to scare you and say, hey, look, know you have a scholarship. You know, if you want to come back next season, it's there for you, but we can't promise you any playing time. We can't promise you any playing time. And they try to scare you out. And they want to know if you really are committed to the program. So um, in order to make some more space, yes, you're going to need guys to enter the portal or leave. Or, you know, a player goes in, talks with a coach, and says, hey, look, this is what my goals are. And they might not necessarily align with what the the best interest for for the team and the team goals are. So um, that's what I would say about that. Talking about DK, I don't know how much he made after the bowl game. I know he made a lot. Um, and I think to carry on Joyner is a prime example of, I mean, he's probably, when it's all said and done, he will be, if he's not on it in terms of Mount Rushmore of Gamecocks, and when I say Mount Rushmore of Gamecocks, I'm not talking specifically about um, their talent, the stats, all that stuff. Um what a what what a pit like you know he epitomizes what being a gamecock and obviously being a student athlete is all about. If he's not on the on that Mount Rushmore, boy is he uh, is he right behind it? You know he'd be that fifth whatever the case may be. But I bring that up because he is a prime example of a guy that didn't necessarily get the playing time, but he's got the NIL opportunities. Yeah. Maybe some players don't want that though. Maybe they truly do want to play, and that's okay. That's okay. Um, Tilton, do you think we get a chance to get Nicholas Harbor to replace him? Look, I can tell you right now that with what South Carolina was able to accomplish over those final two weeks of the season, the possibility of Nicholas Harbor landing at South Carolina has only got um, better. Okay. That's not, I don't want you to go on the message board or, you know, go to work tomorrow and say, Mike said that Nicholas Harbor's coming. That's not what I said. The odds have got better. I'm not going to give you a number because I suck at math. Um, I think I did a tweet the other day about um, Hunter Beamer and his quarter zip. And I think is uh, I think I said three quarter zip. Um, those beautiful things called fractions that I'm awful at. Um, but, you know, th- th- in seriousness, though, I think it's only helped. I think it's only helped. Um, there's going to be a lot of positions on the offensive side next year that need to be filled, whether Spencer Rattler is back next year or not. There's going to be an offensive line that you need to be able to replace. There's going to be a tight end room. Yes, you do have some guys that are still there, but in terms of proven talent on a consistent level, right? Consistently over the last couple of years, South Carolina has had a guy or two that has done exactly that. Right. I mean, think back to what Nick Muse was able to do. Then last year's tight end room obviously was loaded. Um, so it's it's a position that they need some help at. They're going to need depth at. Um, but again, we don't know what the hell this offense is going to look like next year from a schematic standpoint. I think we have an idea. I don't think that you know you have to worry about you know Beamer bringing a guy in. They're going to be running the friggin' wishbone. Like I don't. That's not what I expect. Or South Carolina going out there. Um, empty every friggin' play. I think as cliche as it sounds, I think they do want to be able to run the football. Um, I do think they want to be able to run the football because I feel like in the SEC, even though it's changed over the years, Joe, right? It's not the George Rogers or Bo Jackson or Herschel Walker days necessarily where running backs running the ball 30 times a game. Um, but at the same time, too, if you look at all these conferences, conferences, I'm not talking teams, I'm not talking Army, Navy, right? If you look at all the conferences, I feel like the SEC probably, and I could be wrong. I mean, this is just an, an assumption. Um, they probably run the football more than any other conference. I would assume so. I mean, the Big 12, we know that. That's the Arena Football League. Um, Big 10, they like to run the football. That's 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 pro style. I mean, yeah. it all depends, obviously. It's bigger backs in the Big right? 10. Yeah. Yeah, bigger backs in the Big Ten, and I think the SEC really, you know, they make the running back a skill position. I mean, the running back can do whatever. I mean, we have guys like Juju McDowell on a team, and you have guys like, I mean, we saw like Kevin Harris and Marshawn Lloyd, right? Like, so there's two different backs, and I mean, there's a lot of offenses in the SEC that can really do it all. The Big Ten's more of a power back, pounded down your throat kind of deal. 
uh, and just punt, run, 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 punt, throw the ball on rarity. Um, so I think the SEC does a good job. Yeah, the fade. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I think the SEC does a good job of making uh, the running back a skill position and really honing in on it. I think we that's why a lot of the running backs out of, come out of the SEC, right? Um, Georgia guy like Todd Gurley. Um, Alabama's got these running backs coming out of it. Um, so I, I, I think that's what the SEC is good at and compared to the Big Ten or, and the Big 12 too, um, like you said, the Arena Football League. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I agree, Mike. I think, you know. SEC prioritizes running backs a little bit more. Yeah, and, and again, that's not – there's going to be a wise ass out here that's going to go back and uh, look through all the stats and find out, like, you know, the SEC's third compared to the Big Ten or the ACC in terms of – but it just – it feels that way. Tape-wise, too, right? Like, NFL yeah. teams are looking at the tape. Let's uh, – Let's hit our sponsors real quick, though. We'll pick this up on the other side. Um, as we tell you every week, make sure we pull this up. Our good friends over at Liberty Tax helping you get ready for tax season because you can never get ready for tax season too early. Give them a call. Get over that tax anxiety. Okay? Tax anxiety. 803-462-5576. That is Liberty Tax helping you with your taxes. And if – you want to be able to get a home, right? It is a crazy time to get one right now. Clint Hammond, he'll make that process a little bit easier for you. He'll be able to take that stress away. Give him a call over at the Mortgage Network, 803-576-4450. That is Clint Hammond over at the Mortgage Network. I know we haven't got into, because we've been talking a lot about the portal today, and rightfully so, and it looks like we might have a caller. Um, I know we've been kind of just hopping around so much talking about some of these things. Um, look, as far as the transfer portal goes, I, I think we're, we'll continue to see more players enter the portal over the next couple weeks. I mean, we mentioned them before with the winter window opening yesterday and they got 45 days. I think we will see, and specifically talking about South Carolina right now, I feel like we will see some more players enter the portal, um, after the bowl game. You're going to see it throughout college football in general, but it's just the timing of things right now is a little funky because national signing day isn't until the 21st last year it was the 14th. So I bring that up because the time of everything, right with these coaches and meetings for different schools, it's different this year in comparison to last season. So that when I brought up a little bit earlier, about how Shane Beamer went through the portal last season, the success he had. While he did have success, you're going to continue to have to adapt because things are going to be different. But while that changes, one thing that does not change is our good friend Bree calling into the program. Bree, how are we doing? I'm good, Mike. How are you? I'm doing all right. We're hanging in there. Day two of the transfer portal window. Whew. Yeah, I, I talked on another show about, you know, Jaheim's situation today, but um, I I figured you guys might have a good understanding or a better, because you guys usually have better insider information than most. What is going on with the Park Avenue deal? Because a lot of what I'm hearing is it's been put on hold, and it just feels feels like almost like our university was attacked because it was like, hey, we came up with this cool idea, and now it's like, no you're not going to get to use that. So what what's going on with that? There's a lot of rumors. Joe, have you heard anything? You want me to pick this up? I have not. Um, I was telling Bree, to my knowledge, I don't think the new NCAA regulations have covered anything. But, again, I'm, I'm out of the loop on that. I haven't really done my research. So right now where, where everything is right now is um, – I'm trying to make sure I have everything up. I'm going to pull this up because this was a question that was asked and um, make sure we have this. Okay. So this is, this is what Chris Clark had to say today because Chris does a tremendous job of, uh, of everything for us over at Gar with the Garnet trust. So I wanted to bring this up. He was asked that direct question. Uh, and Chris said, you know, no, it's still around right now. It just has to be restructured in some form or fashion. I think since it was donor funded, there's a way to keep it. It just has to look different slash not be directly associated with the school, if that makes sense. So I think, number one, Bree, to answer your question, um, it still exists, 
But I think, again, we talked about this before with just the NIL transfer, all these crazy things right now in the world of college athletics, never mind college football. I think there's so much gray area going on. And a lot of people are still learning as we go down. And I know you would, you know, I think we're all, we'd all say, oh, you know, college should know better. Mm-hmm. I think some of these colleges are still trying to figure it out themselves. Yeah, I don't think anybody knows knows anything right now. It's all somebody keeps saying it's like the wild, wild west, you know. So yeah, it's I don't think anybody knows anything. I mean, there's no clear cut guidelines a lot of times, or they're constantly changing. So yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. But I just I've it's seen it's just something that came up. I just noticed in the last couple of days a lot. I'm of glad you asked that though, Bree. Oh. I'm glad you asked that because there's probably a lot of people that are curious. Um, that's the reason I wanted to pull it up directly because I remember seeing that today. If you guys are subscribers on Gamecock Central on the Insider Forum, Chris does a great job with Ask Chris questions, it seems like almost every day now. Um, but that was one of the questions I remember coming across. So, you know, I'm glad Bree asked that because I saw that on Twitter today. I hadn't responded back um, because I – my knowledge to it in comparison to a guy like Chris Clark, I just didn't know as much about it, but yeah, bottom line is it's there. I think you will notice a restructure. I'm sure stuff like this will certainly grab the attention of the university to be able to speed that process up a little bit more. Um, If there is, you know, something that is lagging and I don't know if that necessarily is the best way to describe it, but to try to figure out, okay, some of those loose ends that tighten them that could speed that process up. One more question on NIL real quick, and then I'll yep. let you, you know, get back to it. All good. Um, what's, um, I've heard a lot of other rumors about how we're just lacking an NIL fund. Like, you know, like, you know, Clemson's got like 10 mil, and, and Tennessee's got like 20 mil, but we only got like one mil. Are we that far off from everybody? Because I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, but, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, how, where do you find this information from, and are we that far off? I don't think South Carolina is as off as I think some people want to make it out to be. And the reason why I say that is, you know, I brought up an example and I know it's kind of apples to oranges, but talking about college athletics up here in Boston, I mean, NIL opportunities, I'm not saying they don't exist, but they feel like they don't exist. And the main reason why is because you have so many pro sports teams up here. I know it's not going to be the exact same, you know, state to state, but we know as South Carolina, it's in South Carolina, there's no pro sports teams there. And, you know, I, I think of an athlete like Leah Boston, for example, would she be able to get the same amount of NIL opportunities now um, if she was in a different state, let's say like UConn, right? I know Paige Beckers is there, but like there's some athletes that aren't going to get the same amount because of the state that they're in because of the other teams that are in their market. So bringing this back now to football, there are, there are plenty of NIL opportunities. We know again, Garnet trust is one of them um, where we've been able to get people hooked up. I know Jaheim Bell, I think back to last season, um, you know, there was Garnet trust interviews. There was um, uh, the firehouse sub Christmas shopping spree. They took some children out and I know he was part of that. And I'm, I'm mentioning, you know, Jaheim here, but this is, you know, a bunch of student athletes. We know obviously with to carry on Joiner, and that's a little bit different because, you know, he was able to do something with the Duke's Mayo Bowl, but he's had other opportunities. I think what, what athletes are finding out though, Bree, and I think you would agree with this. I think some athletes are realizing like, Hey, I'm not getting something, or at least I'm not getting as much as I thought I was going to get, but my teammates getting more. Well, yeah, no shit. The reason why is that's how life yeah. works. That's how life works. I think that's the unfortunate reality these student athletes are finding out right now, though, Bree, is that not everyone is going to have the same size pie at the table. And some of them are going to want to. Again, this isn't directly go after Bell, but as that report from Brad Crawf- Crawford mentioned that we mentioned earlier, if NIL did play a factor, does Bell feel like he deserves more? If he does, you know what? Best of luck to him. But there's going to be other student athletes that go into it because of NIL. And they're going to find out, hey, yeah, I'm not getting as much as him. And you know what? The grass truly isn't greener on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, absolutely. Yeah, these, guys should try, these guys should try the fight world because, you know, sponsorships and stuff in the fight world, we don't, we don't have the same money that the football world does. And that's, 
you know, if you're not marketable, if there's not something that you're doing to make yourself stand out from the rest, you're not going to yep. make what everybody else makes. Yep. So, I don't we're think we're getting a taste of that that same world we're in, but they got more funding coming in than we do. So, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. there's plenty, and there's plenty of it. Thank yeah. you, Bree. Appreciate you, Bree. Um, yep. No, there's I, there's I'm plenty. Going. There's plenty of uh, NIL opportunities out there, especially in a place like Columbia, South Carolina. Now, we can sit here. We can talk about you know comparing South Carolina to Southern Cal or comparing it to another school. I get that. I understand that. But I think someone brought it up earlier. Go ask Texas A&M how much that helped them. At the end of the day, you still have to be able to run your business within – and it starts with the CEO. And in this case, of course, that CEO is Shane Beamer. He has to make sure everyone's on the same page. He has to make sure everyone's pulling in the same direction. Are there going to be guys that want to be able to get their own? Of course. Of course. You know, they want to do their side hustles. Okay. But as long as you're still pulling in the direction of the program and ultimately what's best for the team, what's best for the team, then that's going to be all right. Um, but when you do have all these other NIL opportunities, what's scary as a coach right now, Joe, is you have to manage that. You have to manage the thought process of how players are essentially thinking on a day-to-day basis. How are they viewing their day-to-day job, their day-to-day responsibility as a student athlete, and what you're asking them to do each week on the football field? How are they managing that? with what they're either being told from people on the outside or what they're seeing. And what I'm saying seeing is it could be their teammate that's right next to him in the locker room, right? It could be someone on social media that they uh, went to high school with or played against, or they're seeing other uh, athletes get student, uh, get NIL opportunities. And they start saying, why am I not getting that? Why am I not getting that? That is the issue that we're running into. And we talk about, when we talk about, the success that Beamer has had in the portal and this and that. It's tough to say what he did last year is what he's going to replicate again, because this keeps changing. I think he'd be the first one to tell you it keeps changing. We talk about how, um, you know, millennials and um, you know, I don't know what the hell your generation is called, but you know, I bring, I bring all that up because the way people think it's going to continue to shift. Right. And I'm not saying necessarily millennials and this and that, but I'm talking about, okay, the way people thought about NIL a couple of years ago, or even going back to the days of Ryan Brewer, that's changed over the last couple of years. And now what we're going to continue to see is it's going to continue to change. So when you're coaching and when you're trying to get everyone to buy in and pull in the same direction, you're going to have players now coming through high school. And we deal with it, Joe, right? At on three, dealing with the Gamecock Central, we have players that know what they're they're worth. I mean, Arch Manning, obviously, guys like him, Bronny James is an exception to the rule. Arch mm-hmm. Manning, all right, his NIL valuation, three point four million dollars. Three point four. So I bring that up because there's gonna be guys that go through this in high school. It doesn't have to necessarily be an Arch Manning. But they see what their value is, or they feel like their value should be more. And that's going to be something that will continue to impact college football. So when you go into the transfer portal, and Johnny was a five-star here, okay? Does he think the same way like a guy did a couple years before him? Spencer Rattler. I think Spencer Rattler, all this outside noise about – well, was Spencer Rattler going to fit in from a character standpoint? I don't think that was an issue one bit. I think if anything, as we saw from his teammates the other night, he was voted um, MVP. What does that say about the way that they view him? So I, I mean, th- those are just things that that make me that make me think about the. And I, I want to apologize to people tonight. I know we've spent way more time on the transfer portal probably than me and Joe even anticipated. Um, the offensive coordinator higher. We'll hit on some things briefly. I don't really want to go too much longer here tonight. But um, I think just because of what took place yesterday, it's difficult not to talk about it. 
And I'm glad that Bree called in so we could talk about the, uh, the Park Avenue uh, situation as well. Yeah. I mean, Mike, I did have one, I guess one thing to kind of put a cap on the NIL stuff. It's probably a pretty good note to put it on, but I mean, my example was, I mean, yeah, obviously you hear about Clemson and, you know, Texas a having all this money stocked up, but that's not going to stop guys from leaving. Right. The one guy that I was thinking of, you look at Ohio state, right. They, they should have all the donor money in the world. And yet Quinn Ewers left to go to Texas. And so that just, I mean, it makes to the point that like guys are going to go leave and go not only because of NIL, and I own uh, NIL is only a piece of the pie in this whole thing. Like, right. You still got to factor in the playing time. You still got to factor in close to home, wants to be close to mom and dad yeah. playing time. That kind of thing gets beat out for a job. There's so many different layers on holding on to a player and keeping a player. Now that the transfer portal is wide open, it's going to be so much harder to keep guys. So you can't really get upset where, and now granted, I understand the frustration with the Jaheim situation because he just got up and left. But, um, you know, there's going to be so many different layers and NIL is only a small piece of the pie because Quinn Ewers had it made at Ohio State. He could have, you know, he, he signed a multi-million dollar deal out of high school and just straight up left, took the donor's money and left. And so I think it's just, it's a small piece of the pie and, you know, it's, it's, you just got to factor it in. I want to look at Blake's question. Anyone talking about, you know, the portal rules and all this and that. Yes. If you enter the portal, and you leave that first time now, you can play immediately. That wasn't the case a couple of years ago. That has changed. If you transfer that second time, you have to sit out a year. What is making things, I guess you could say, is muddy in the waters up a little bit, is that COVID year from 2020. It's really confusing. I mean, honestly, even as someone that covers this stuff, when you're looking at certain players – Sometimes it's confusing because you got to remind yourself, oh, wait, yeah, he's got a COVID year too, you know? So I bring that up because you look at it, someone could graduate, but then they might have an additional two years of eligibility left, you know, or three years of eligibility because of what. So th those are some things to just keep in mind when you look at it. Jeff brings up something. Jeff, I'll say this. If there's one thing we could change, change about the portal, I don't know if it's directly with the portal. But th this is something I've thought about, though. And I, I know it doesn't impact, you know, the big picture. But it, to me, it, it, it still could be something that, of value. A couple of years ago, the NCAA changed the rule that allows student athletes to be able to participate in four games. Okay. And still be able to maintain their eligibility if they play in four games or less. I think that um, is something that the NCAA needs to look at and decide if that is something that should stay in play. As much as I love the idea, I love the idea of players, especially as we head into this bowl game. Okay. And maybe that could be the gray area where the bowl game, you know, could be if we, if we change the rule, the way I'm talking about it, that is kind of the outlier and you're, you're able to get a pass on that, but in the regular season, at least, um, if you appear in one game, you use your eligibility. And the reason why I say that is I don't know what the NCAA can do based on when you're talking about laws, too. Like, there's things where the NCAA with NI, like, their hands are tied. You can only do so much, right? So I feel like you control. I mean, we hear about it in football all the time. Control what you can control. And I feel like what the NCAA can control, and unfortunately, it will, it will, um, it will impact players who probably weren't going to be affected by NIL opportunities. But if you play, you use your year of eligibility. And the reason I say that is what I'm afraid of is, especially with NIL continuing to grow. I think we saw this a couple of years ago at a school um, with a quarterback, I believe. I don't know if it was Houston, SMU. I'm trying to remember exactly where it was. Uh, but a player, I think he was the starting quarterback too, four games. And then he decided to sit out the rest of the year and transfer. And guess what? You don't use any eligibility when you do that. So I bring that up because that's what I'm afraid of, is that with NIL being in the mix now, because we can sit here and talk about tampering and you know what you're allowed to. Look, even before NIL, we know players were getting paid. We know they were being given cars and laptops or whatever the case may be. And if you think your school didn't do it, you're kidding yourself. Every major school has done it. Every major school has done something in some shape, way, or form. So I bring that up because I think it's only going to get worse 
when you're talking about NIL because you're going to have people that will reach out to mommy, to daddy, to uncle Johnny, to the bro, or whoever. And they're going to try to influence having their kid or a friend, relative or whatever, sit out the rest of the year to enter that portal so they can save their eligibility and go play for them the following season and promise them, hey, we'll get you this NIL opportunity. That's one thing that I would say. So, again, not directly uh, about the portal, but it impacts the portal, if that makes sense, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, to your point about and I or, um, you know, guys getting, I guess, handouts, if you will, um, before before uh, the NIL stuff was opened up. I'll just say this, since Cam Smith is entering the NFL draft now, um, I lived with Cam Smith freshman year, and he was driving a brand-new Mustang. Um, I remember as freshman, we all moved in at the same time, and Cam Smith had a fresh-new Mustang, and it was so cool. Um, and that was before all the NIL stuff started, and not to dock Cam Smith or anything. And maybe, maybe Cam Smith had a really well-paying job in high school. He was able to afford a Mustang and stuff like that, but not – I mean, I think it's been in place. Um, in terms of something I'd change – um, Mike, I, I mean, I haven't really thought about it. I like kind of like what you said about, you know, the four games. I think that's, I guess, a way to scheme the system. Plus, I think you got guys like JT Daniels who's transferring for a fourth time. And I there think it is. Shout out, out. Real, real quick, intern Joe, shout out to Al Stevens. Yep, that's who it was. It was uh, King from Houston. Thank you, Al. Yeah. And so I think I don't I think there should probably be a limit on how many times guys can transfer. Um, at, at some point, you do have to bite the bullet and be like, maybe this isn't for me. Um, and you know, I, I don't know. I think the JT Daniels thing, like him transferring again, um, I, I don't necessarily know if that should be allowed. Like, I, I just, it doesn't seem right. Um, and I don't know, like I said, um, Teddy goes, Klein. look, there's going to always be outliers. Okay. And I'm not saying that's the reason why Clowney came here. I'm saying in general, things happen at every school. Okay. I'm not saying like every player that South Carolina had during that 2010, like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is there's been something, at least one thing done. That's what I'm trying to get at. There's been one thing done at all these schools. Um, I do want to go back to this real quick, then we'll wrap things up. We hit on that about the Park Avenue. Um, again, if you're just joining us, Chris Clark, colleague over at Gamecock Central, he had mentioned it over on the uh, Insider Forum. And uh, basically what he said is that they're trying to continue to work through it. There's some things that I don't think they were aware of that they're going to have to separate them from. Um, this was the exact quote from Chris about the new NCAA to issue guidelines, of course, um, you know, that he was asked about. And he said, you know, Park Avenue, it's still it's still around. The deal's still around. It just has to be restructured in some form or fashion. I think since it was donor funded, there's a way to keep it. It just has to look different slash not be directly associated with the school, if that makes sense. Um, so just want to bring that up. Um we hit on that one about Kroger's tweet. Jeff asked, Mike, how important is it to recruit North of uh, Virginia? Do we have someone that recruits that area? Yes, we, uh, yes, there, there is. And that's Pete Lumbo and Pete Lumbo does a really good job. Um, I've said this before about Massachusetts. You might have a blue chip player that will come out. I don't know, once a year. Um, there's really, you know, there's really not as much talent up in Massachusetts. I can speak in Massachusetts and up um, the further you go up North. I mean, there's going to be guys that are talented, but more times than not, it's not the case in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. I mean, it's just too small. Um, the state that's really talented though, that's North of Virginia, I would say is New Jersey. New Jersey has a lot of talent. Um, I felt like our college team was loaded with it. Um, and some of their teammates were playing some some pretty high level ball, you know, in Power Five schools. Pennsylvania is another school that uh, you should keep an eye on. Um, there's a Bo Jangles there too, by the way. In Reading, Pennsylvania, it makes no sense how far north that is, but um, that there's a Bo Jangles up that far north. But um, those are two states I would keep an eye on. But as we always talk about, you know, with um, the DMV area, right? Being able to get DC, Virginia, and Maryland. And I know that kind of takes away part of your question though, Jeff, about Virginia. Um, that area is so important. It's so freaking important. The talented players that come out of that area. And I think Beamer has done a tremendous job. That was an area for whatever reason 
until the end of the Beamer era. I mean, uh, Muschamp era. That was an area that South Carolina just didn't have as much success when Muschamp was here. They they hit on guys, right? They had Lloyd here, um, but that was just an area that they weren't able to really take advantage of. Um, Joe, I don't know if there's any final thoughts you want to be able to get to. Leave intern Joe alone. He's just no. fired up. He's fired up. All right. He's fired up. He, he grew up in he grew up in South Bend. He gets to see Notre Dame play uh, the Gamecocks. You guys can give him a bunch of crap though if you want to ask him who's going to win, um, who he's pulling for. Um, I mean, technically, I'm not supposed to be pulling for anybody, but off the record, Mike, as a student of South Carolina, I hope they kill him. I hope they go. kill him. I didn't get into that. Look, Joe, I'm throwing you softballs to be able to win back the people. I mean, yeah. intern Joe is a uh, is a national. I, didn't Notre Dame. I hope they kill him. To all my friends at Notre Dame, I hope they get killed. Killed. I hope South Carolina kills him, Mike. Um, off, the record, off the record, right? Um, f- quick thoughts on uh, just the OC uh, hiring. We'll get we'll get off here. Um, I think as far as when we could see a hire, the only thing that I was told and this was last week, and it's just going to be like, wow, you're really going out of a uh, – there we go. Look at Joe. Can see you win the people back over. Intern Joe, winning the people back over. That's all the, the people only, the, only, the only timeline I've been given is that it will happen before signing day. Um, I know there's going to be some people like, you know, woo-hoo. Uh, that's, that's, that's phenomenal, Mike. Like you're really going out of – that's the only thing I was told directly about a timeline. Um, I do think, though, that what we will see – and I think I said this last week, we will see a direct impact on who they hire as an OC. And when I say that, I don't want you to think that if Rattler does not come back next season, that means it's a bad hire. There's, there's going to be, there's going to be people that look at that um, depending on what Rattler does. And that's how they're going to view it. I mean, shoot, you could bring in freaking Bill Walsh. All right. You could, you could bring some of the greatest Football minds in from an offensive standpoint to run USC's offense. And if Rattler, for whatever reason, chose to not come back, there's going to be people that look at him and be like, well, that's the reason he didn't come back. Eh, that's not a good hire. I, so I bring that up because, as I reported last week, I think it was last Wednesday, who USC hires, as I was told from people close to the situation, will have an impact on whether Rattler comes back next season. Now, one of the other factors, which I think we were able to see it a little bit last night, um, but this has been another layer that Rattler is talking about, is who comes back next season. He might not come out and directly say that, but look, for the people that have been yapping about the offensive line the last two years, you got your wish. They're gone. The, the offensive line's gone. Yes, you're bringing in some very talented offensive linemen, but I'm sorry, I don't think that every player that's coming in this year is going to be day one starters. So I bring that up because when Rattler is deciding what is in the best interest of him in his future, it's not just the offensive coordinator, which, again, is going to play a role. And I was told it's going to play a big role. But he also needs to figure out who's coming back. Does Juice come back? Does Marshawn Lloyd come back? To some of these other weapons, now that we know that Stogner is not coming back, now that we know Jaheim Bell's not coming back, are some of these other weapons returning next season for him? So that's something I would say about that. But and here's the other caveat, and we'll leave it off on this. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it off on this. If Rattler does not return next season, I do not rule out the possibility that Dante Reno would reclassify to the class of 2023. Okay. Do not rule that out. So again, that's not to say that um, that would be a definite, but that is also something I think has kind of gone under the radar. If Rattler does not return next season, um, I have been told that USC doesn't anticipate going into the portal to find a quarterback for next season. Um, unless there was someone that just absolutely was like a, a, the can't miss kid. Okay. Um, and then they'll go from there. They'll go from there. Um, obviously you have Luke Doty coming back. And I think a lot of people would expect, well, I think there'd be some people that maybe wouldn't, but I think some people would expect that, um, that Doty would have an opportunity 
to go. What is – Mike, tell us who the OC is. We know you and Chris know. There's been no hire yet. I, re- I, I truly wish I could tell you something. Like even last week when all the Mullen stuff – and I, I remember just getting phone calls. Everyone's like asking me about Mullen. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? Because I hadn't heard anything about Mullen. Um, the funny thing about all that, though, was I wanted to, you know, I like to have fun with certain things, like, but I know, I know where the line is. You know, you don't want to push it. Um, but the funny thing about it is, Dan Mullen, I covered him in Mississippi. I covered him uh, Dak Prescott senior year. When I worked in Mississippi, I covered Mississippi State, I covered Ole Miss, Swag Kelly, and then one of the wildest drafts we've ever seen with Laramie Tonsil dropping, um, as we all recall what happened that year in the 2015 NFL draft, um, or the 2016 NFL draft, excuse me, since it was the 2015 season I covered. But um, the funny thing is Mullen's football, basketball, and track coach in high school was my assistant football coach in high school. So we had we built a connection. So... I would have loved, I would have loved for the opportunity to, to cover Mullen. Um, I do think he's a good coach outside of personal failings. I think he's a good coach. I think he's done some good things um, with quarterbacks and we've seen that before. Um, but as we saw today, you know, he came out on the radio and said, uh, yeah, USC is going to get a good OC. It's just not going to be me. Uh, in turn, Joe, any final thoughts before we wrap things up? I mean, I don't, I, I know. Um, I think Chris reported that Dan Mullen might be out. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I got to go back and check the report. But um, I think there's a couple different guys on the offensive coordinator position um, that are really interesting. But, um, yeah, Mike, I think Spencer is one domino in the whole thing. And I I, I agree that um, it does take some precedence. The OC thing, I think, you know, that definitely makes sense. And it also kind of depends on who he leaves. And same thing for a lot of guys. That's why we haven't had necessarily the big guys in the portal or announcing that they're going to go for the draft because I think South Carolina could make a splash with this OC hire. Um, so I, I, I think it's going to be interesting as to who, and I mean, you said before signing day, so it's coming up, I mean, within the next two weeks and it'll be before the bowl game. So fans will be able to, you know, take that with them, be happy heading into Notre Dame. Teddy, I, I, I think I know what you're trying to say here. Why the heck did the offensive, um, I'm, I'm assuming you're trying to say offensive coach for the line, the OC. I, I mean, if you're talking about the OC, meaning, uh, cause I, I see the line, so I don't know if he's talking about offensive line coach. The offensive line coach hasn't left. Greg Atkins is still here. Um, if that's not what you're talking about, OC line. Um, if you're talking about offensive coordinator, I felt like, you know, and I said this back in the spring, Joe. I don't know if I said this to you. I mean, I said this to multiple people. I kind of joked. I said, I don't think Rule's going to last this season in Carolina. I think the writing was on the wall, and I know there's a lot of Panther fans on here that would be like, yeah, we, we kind of saw it too. Um, and I joked, I said, look, I said, I don't think if, uh, if, if rule gets the, if, if rule gets fired, he's going to come back to the college world and he's going to want to bring, uh, Satterfield and, you know, unless Satterfield puts up some type of video game numbers all season and Beamer offers him a contract that he can't say no to, I don't see him being back this season. Of course he left. So basically to answer that. They have such a good relationship, Rule and Satterfield, that it was a no-brainer. Um, on top of the fact of you know the way that his family was treated by some Gamecock fans, um, and I and I you know people get upset when you rope that in. It, I know it's not everybody. I know it's not everybody. Um, but there, you know, and I think some people saw stuff on social media. You know, they took a beating. You know, I mean, and. As I was told, Marcus knows that it comes with the job, the territory, um, but it certainly did hurt the family. I know that when when the family was getting involved and the girl has to go to school and she's hearing crap. I mean, I had to deal with it on a much smaller scale when my dad was a head coach. Um, so I, you know, I understand what that can be like sometimes, and it's not fun. It can it can really hurt families. Um, what did Ancho say? Huge if if big. Thanks for breaking the news, Mike. Um, I'm going to get now, Mike. Yeah. All right. That's all she wrote tonight, guys. We're going to do this again next week. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get down to Jacksonville for the bowl game. Um, and if I am, would love to be able to see you guys. I haven't been able to see a lot of you guys in a long time. Um, but in addition to that, if we are going down there, we're going to have some exciting news. Um, 
that may involve our post game show. So I will keep you guys all posted with that. But again, we will do a show next week. Test this out today. I know Bree came on and you're like, you guys started a little bit early. We started today at six, wanted to try something out just because of uh, college basketball season. I know the Gamecocks weren't playing tonight, but wanted to give that a try, see what that was like. And uh, intern Joe, what are you doing over there? Try not to blink, man. Try not to blink because your guest stokes, man. Your guest's as good as mine, my guy. I have no idea. No idea. Mike has the breaking news. He won't <laughs> blow him up on Twitter. He knows exactly I do not. <laughs> He knows exactly who it is. Exactly who it is. It. He just won't tell you. You'll know when I – if there's something to report, you know it's coming when I put, put the suits out, the suit tweet. The closet tweet, Joe, when I have all the suits, that's when you know the announcement's coming soon. So yeah. uh, be on the lookout for that. Yep, absolutely. Honcho, I promise, nothing, <laughs> uh, nothing, nothing has been decided yet. But when we get it, when we get it, we will, we will put that out there. I promise. So does Chris. Chris. Intern Joe for the win. Intern Joe for the win always. Hey, appreciate you guys tuning in tonight. Uh, again, next Tuesday, not sure what time yet. Um, it'll either be six or seven, most likely seven. But, you know, again, we'll uh, just wanted to try this out. Let us know from a feedback standpoint what you guys prefer. If uh, the Gamecocks playing at seven uh, the next couple of weeks, I don't know. I haven't looked at the schedule quite yet to know if they're playing on seven because I'm juggling 80 jobs it feels like right now um let me know what you guys think and we will adjust accordingly intern joe appreciate you being on guys have been watching gc live talking tuesday nights if you missed any of it go back to the gamecock central youtube page you can watch this show in its entirety and it'll be also uploaded on the gamecock central podcast platform